Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a real special guest. We have Dwayne Adams of Dwayne Adams Guide Service. And if anybody has hunted deer, especially in Arizona, I know they've heard of Dwayne Adams and uh, they owe Dwayne a lot. If Even if you don't know Dwayne, uh, you, you owe, uh, we all owe Dwayne a lot because he's one of the first guys to glass with a tripod and one of the first guys to really implement sitting and glassing. And I know I've learned a lot from from this man. And I'm looking forward to this interview. And uh, Dwayne, how you doing? I'm doing very fine. And that's very kind words. But uh, thank you very much. Sounds good. Dwayne, you have been hunting deer in Arizona for how long? Or when did you get your start? I've been guiding for 38 years, uh, Jay. And... and uh, and chasing big mule deer and chasing coos deer for 38 years with, with the guide's license. Would you say that, uh, I know you hunt other things, but you, you have a special passion for deer. Uh, would you say that you like one or, or the other as far as coos deer or mule deer better? Um, wondering if you could speak to that. No, actually, I like them both, uh, to be very honest with you, because you know, just like anything, as long as you're a, 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 a real quality guide, you just like to hunt. And I love the glass, and there's nothing like seeing a 110-inch coos deer, but there's also nothing like seeing a 200-inch mule, mule deer. So they're, they're, they really get into your blood. For sure. I think one of the common things with both of those animals, especially here in Arizona, is they're, you know, they're both very glassing-oriented animals in that uh, you know, you obviously like to glass, I like to glass, and I think people that really get into deer hunting, especially in our state of Arizona, uh, there's just something about getting a good pair of binoculars and sitting down and really looking the country over and observing, you know, God's creation. Uh, what got you started uh, realizing that a tripod was going to help you be more effective? Well, about 40-some-odd years ago, <clears throat> I was glassing some deer <clears throat> by hand held, and I couldn't hold them up. And so I borrowed the neighbor's tripod, and I rubber band them, my binoculars, on the tripod, and, and that's what got it started. I just took some rubber bands and rubber banded them on the tripod over 40 years ago, and that's how I got started. In, when you first started doing that, Dwayne, uh, was that like on a 10 power or an 8 power binocular? And then how did that, you know, success of doing that with rubber bands then lead you to the 15s and what have you? Well, it was actually a pair of 8 by 35s, and uh, that's what I had rub rubber band on there. And then I finally got a little bit of money and I wanted to buy a pair of binoculars so I went down to Jensen's the old Jensen store and a gentleman down there that was probably the world best glasser at the time was a guy named Bill Hardy and he had the only pair of 1556s in the state of Arizona and I bought a pair of 1040 customs 1050 customs and I started glassing with them and after I realized how how good I'd got and how many animals I'd seen. I went back down there, Jay, and I'll tell you if this is a forty years ago, those binoculars cost me twelve hundred and sixty dollars. That's a lot of money back then. Well, I worked overtime for six months and I saved the money. And when I went down to buy them, I had to order them. I had to put half the money down, and they I ordered them. It was the best move I ever made in my life, and I tell people that story all the time because it opened the whole world up that uh, I, I would have never been able to see without those Zeiss binoculars. Okay, so I was going to ask you what the manufacturer. So those were the 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 old style ten by forty uh, Zeiss uh, with like the black rubber coatings, and they still make that model today. Is that the is that the exact? No, uh, no, no, no. That's not it. it, it they're fifteen by. 60s and they and and the coating on them is leather it you've probably never even seen them they 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 put a leather uh band around them and i've only seen two pairs in my lifetime a pair i have and a pair that bill hardy has do you still is that the binocular that you still use today or have you 
gotten another pair since then? No, I, I, I don't use them now. I put them up because now I think they're more worth more money now than what I paid for them. <laughs> <laughs> and plus the coatings, Jay, have, have changed so drastically. And, and the coatings on the new binoculars today, from Zaworski to Leica to Zeiss, are so much more, so more advanced. And, and I, what now I'm using now is, is a Zaworski 15 by 56 is the HDs. Yeah, they're, that's what I have, and they're really hard to beat. Let's back up just a second. Uh, uh, Dwayne, uh, what do you do as a profession uh, other than guiding? I don't. All I do is, is guide. Okay, so you're a full-time guide, and you've been a guide for 38 years. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you uh, live in the San Manuel area, which explain to people where that is and where you've spent you know, cut your teeth on hunting, you know, using binoculars. Kind of talk a little bit about that southern Arizona region that you live in. Well, I live northeast of Tucson, about 40 miles in a place called Salmon Well, and I cut, I cut my teeth glassing big mule deer in the desert in January, and I cut my teeth on, on coos deer in the Catalinas and the Galeros, and then I expanded, you know, to all the units uh, after I got more and more uh, proficient with glassing. But this is where I learned how to hunt was here. And what have you in, I'm going to talk to you today about not only coos deer, uh, some uh, strategies and tactics for kind of these early seasons, but we're also going to talk, we're going to kind of do a two part series on uh, the Kayabab and the early season there. My first question, let's, let's talk about coos deer first. Um, you talk about the Galeros and the Catalinas. What have you noticed over the last 40 years as far as uh, overall hunting, uh, you know, pressure, uh, animal behavior? You know, are you finding deer on the same hillsides? You know, just kind of talk a little bit about if, if any changes that you've noticed in that southern Arizona region with the coos deer. You know, Jay, in a lot of seminars I give, I'm asked that question. And the first thing that most people are going to want me to say is that there's not any big deer out there and they've been shot off. And that's the last thing that's really happening. Jay, every year there's a gigantic buck killed. And last year, Brandon McDermott killed a buck that scored 165 with the governor's tag. And I'm going to tell you, I have seen bigger bucks probably in the last five years than I've ever seen in my life. And I, I, I think that it's a matter of looking where those great big deer are because I think they live there, and most people don't look there. I really believe that there's gigantic bucks. I've been fortunate enough to kill 495 coos deer on public land, and I've killed 42 Boone and Crockett coos deer all on public land, and I've killed the most of the Boone and Crockett's, Jay, in the last 10 years. What do you attribute that to? Well, I, I, do, I do attribute that. I think I'm probably a better hunter than I was when I was a young man. I did a lot more crazy walking. But what I found is that those great big deer don't move like people think they do. Uh, they're literally in one canyon or very isolated. And if you don't stay there and keep looking for them, it's easy to say they're not there and you move on. And, and a lot of times I'm sitting three and four days and not moving from one canyon because I know that buck's there. A lot of people have a hard time understanding that unless they hunt coos deer and realize how habitual they are and how, you know, they are very patternable, but you need time. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the time factor in uh, trying to, you know, pattern and, and stay on and then end up harvesting a big coos deer. Well, everything you, you're saying right there is a fact. Most people don't have the time, and that's why they don't have a chance to kill a great big deer consistently. And, and guys like myself and all the other top guys are, are doing that because once you locate a big buck, he's pretty easily kill, killable if you can just stay on him. Once you locate that deer, he'll come back out and make a mistake. It might be in the morning or it might be in the evening, but he'll make a mistake. But it might not be the day that you're hunting. That's, that's the key. It might be two or three days down the road. But sooner or later, he'll come out, and when he does, it, he, they're very killable if you pattern them like that. 
Talk to me about the discipline that it takes to know that a big deer, let's say you get up on a point and you see a big deer and let's say you've seen them a couple of times and then the hunt starts like, you know, the hunt that's going to start on Friday. It's, it's October. It's the, 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 uh, the, 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 the weather pattern is supposed to be very, very warm and you get up there and you go for a couple of days and you don't see that deer. It's human nature to want to just say, oh, he's moved, he's, you know, a lion got him, he's whatever. Tell me about how you have to mentally prepare for knowing that you just have to stick it out and just find him when he's going to make that mistake. Well, well, in most places, there are a lot of places to glass from if that buck's in a pocket. So a lot of times I might glass in the morning from one position and then move to another position for to get a different angle. I always teach in the glassing lessons that it, the angle of the dangle is more important, more important than anything else. And what I mean by that is you can be 100 yards down the ridge and he can see the deer and, and me 100 yards from one of my friends, I can't see it. He's got the right angle. So there's no sense of sitting there for the whole day and looking at the same angle. You've got to just keep moving and looking at that same position, but from different angles, Jay. I can't stress that enough if it, 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 is get the different angle and keep moving. And I do that for two or three days in just different places. And then sooner or later, he'll make a mistake. So in other words, Dwayne, you're basically focusing your attention on a uh, how big of an area, but what I hear you saying, so it's going to be kind of a two-part question. You're, I, I'm estimating that you're like looking at a, a dot and then you're looking 100 yards north, south, east, and west. So you've got a 100-yard circle or maybe a 300, you know, tell me about kind of your, your, your diameter that you're looking at. But what I hear you saying is you're going to bounce around and get different shade looks, get different angles, maybe look a little more level, get up high, look down, uh, maybe look up depending on the terrain. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Everything that you just said is exactly what I'm doing, and every buck's a little different. Sometimes, sometimes those great big bucks are not in thick places. Sometimes they're way out in the flats where people don't look. Just because they've grown up out there and nobody looks by them, and they drive by them, a lot of mesquites, or a lot of Palo Verdes, or a lot of thick Ocotillas. But a lot of times i got to get high enough that I can look out there to those positions, and sooner or later a deer will come out of a wash and he'll make a mistake. And in fact, one of the biggest bucks I've ever killed, that's exactly how I killed him, is he made a mistake and then we were able to kill him, and he scored almost 140. You talk about big bucks and some of them being out in the flats. Um, if, if you, if you had to target and say, this is where the big bucks are. And I know this is kind of a crazy question, but if, if you had to be pinned down to say, where would I go to find a big buck? Is there a certain type of terrain that you would say you're going to find more big bucks here? What would it be? Well, it's not in the middle of the mountain because that's where the hunters are. It's the other. It's just the opposite of if you take a mountain range and you draw a line in the middle of it, they're either going to be pushed to the top or pushed out in the flats. So I don't hunt the middle. I hunt one or the other. That's good advice. Um, that's very interesting. So in the Catalinas and in the Galeros, those are both two very historic mountain ranges in Arizona. And the interesting thing about both ranges is they have, uh, from from unit border to unit border, they have everything from, you know, low desert where, you know, it's, it's mule deer and maybe even a coos deer. It's very rare to see a coos deer all the way up to, you know, seven, eight thousand feet even higher in the Catalinas. Um, you, what you're saying is the deer, the hunters go where the highest deer densities are. So over a period of time bucks tend to 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 be older either higher on the mountain or lower on the mountain is that what you're saying that's exactly what i'm saying and that's what i've learned in my lifetime is is it, it a deer just has to grow up out there if he it, or up there either way if he's between three and a half and about six and a half years old those bucks have a chance to get monstrous 
and they have a chance to really grow horns out there and, 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 and get the whole cycle of life. But if they're standing up there in the middle of the mountain where all these bald ridges are, where it's easy for a guy to, to start killing those deer when they're, you know, 70, 80, 90 inch deer, they'll never make that peak of whatever the peak they're going to grow. So that's one reason that when they start that pressure, I, I look way low or way high. And when I left a little coffee yet, this is very important. It's going to be very thick and it's not going to be very glassable, but that's, that's where some of those monster bucks live. But I will tell you this, Way high has a tendency to, to for the lions to whack them. They very seldom whack them very low. And that, in that's other words, very the, lion, the lions use that high country to their advantage, and they can really wipe the bucks out. So what you're saying is maybe you might find more bucks way low because the lions are not as heavy or don't kill them as hard uh, down low. I think They're that's the truth. I think that's the truth, Jay, because a lot of the lion hunters that I know, uh, Andy Knowlton and and Wade uh, uh, Eccles that, that chases, they don't kill a lot of cats in that low, low country. They kill a lot of cats in country that's very rocky, very rough, and brutal. And and, and when they they say, hey, "I killed a big lion and it was on a big coos deer," and I found the rack. I, they very seldom find that down in the desert. It's mostly up in the high mountains where it's tough. And so that deer that's made it through the rifle season, he's by himself. He's easy pickings for a lion. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I wonder how much uh, not catching lions down low has to do with a lot of lion hunters don't really like to run their dogs in the cholla too much. I, I wonder if that plays into it, do you think, or do you think there's just not as many lions down low? I don't know that. I'm not a lion hunter. I, 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 don't, I don't have a clue, to be very honest with you. Uh, you'd have to ask one of those guys. I just know that, that uh, once I find a big deer in the low country, I generally have a great chance to kill it. That's good stuff. Let's take a quick break here. Guys, the title sponsor of my podcast is GoHunt.com Insider, and they're doing a 30-day free trial exclusive for the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash J. Scott and click on the blue free trial button and go through the steps. It only takes a couple of minutes. You will be required to provide a credit card, but you will not be charged until after the free 30 days. You can cancel at any time within the first 30 days to prevent being charged. If you have any questions at all, you can email free trial at GoHunt.com and someone from the GoHunt team will promptly respond. This is your opportunity to see what all the buzz is about and the filtering 2.0 system and the application strategies for the Western hunter. Phonescope is a company that makes custom-molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. It is simple to text photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. Phonescope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. Get yours now by using the J. Scott 16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at Phonescope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at Phonescope. Okay, Dwayne, uh, speaking of lions, uh, just on a side note, uh, have you seen a ton of lions through your binoculars in 40 years? And if so, could you estimate how many you've seen? I've probably glassed 50 to maybe 60 lions in my lifetime. And and I tell people this all the time, and they think that I've lost my mind. But the, the reason that I do, we see two or three or four lions a year. And the reason that we see them is because we're always looking where the deer are, and that's where the lions are going to be. And I yeah. try to teach that in a lot of the glassing lessons. I tell people, I said, you're going to glass a lion now because once you find where these deer are, the lions are going to move them. It's the same in, in, in anything. The, the cats are going to be where the food is, and it's that yeah. simple. They're, they're a lot smarter hunter than I am because they hunt 24-7, 365 days out of the year. So they're going to be where the food is. They're not going to starve to death. So if, once you figure that out, you'll start glassing those lions. Okay, let's, um, I want to ask you a question with these 
early season hunts coming up. Uh, typically a lot warmer, a lot different weather than say those November or even, you know, the later December or even into the January archery seasons. Specifically for these early season hunts when it's still warm, what strategies do you take to the field as far as where are you going to look specifically for the deer? Jay, all the food grows on the southeast sides of the ridges. All the beds are on the northwest side. So when the sun comes up, the way God designed it, the food is going to be on the southeast sides. So that's where I'm looking for about an hour. After that hour, say 8 o'clock in the morning, I switch and I look at the northwest side of the ridges the rest of the day. And so basically what I try to tell people is that half the ridge is food and half of it's bed. And you have to understand how to distinguish which, which one is which. A lot of times I can glass a guy, Jay, across the canyon, and I'll tell the client, I said, the guy's clueless. He's, I, he'll say, what do you mean say that, Dwayne? I said, he's looking where the deer were 30 minutes ago. They're on the other side of the ridge now. I said, he's not a threat. But I can also look over there and see a guy like yourself sitting there, and you're looking at the right side. I said, that guy knows what he's doing. So... Once you understand the pressure zones, then it, it makes hunting so much easier because you're always looking where the deer are. That makes, that makes good sense. So just so I'm clear, I've always focused uh, glassing for beds on the north slopes, obviously, but I thought it was more northeast slopes because the sun obviously sets in the west, and so it would be more north and more east than more north and west. I just wanted to make sure... Uh, if 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 you didn't misspeak, you're still saying northwest slopes for for bedding deer, then not northeast slopes. That's correct. I'm saying northwest. When you okay. when when the sun comes up, all those little bowls that will be in the shade will be in yep. the will be on the west side. Even even if the the way they're facing, they'll be on the west side because the east, the sun hits those hillsides. It's just Jay, it's just real easy. At daybreak, look at those hills, and the sun will, 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 will hit those hills. But every little pocket that's in the shade, that's going to be facing west. Okay, okay. And that's where it's really important that you get the right angle. You may not be able to see that from the angle that you're setting, and I might have to walk, you know, five or 600 or a quarter mile down a ridge or get a point to look back in that pocket. Okay, that's good stuff. Now... I've heard it said, and it just makes me cringe, and I wanted to get your take on it. I've heard it said that coos deer hunters put your sun at your back in the morning and put the sun at your back in the evening. And there's a couple things I cringe on, but the one for sure that I cringe on is telling coos deer hunters to put the sun at their back in the evening. To me, I want the, if anything, sun at my back in the morning, sun in my face in the afternoon. And a lot of people say, well, that's not a good look because you're looking into the sun. I totally disagree. What's your thought? No, you hit it right on the head. That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you to do is what you're saying. I, in the morning, and I, you have to have the sun at your back, and then you got as soon as that thing illuminates when the sun hits it, you, you, you're just going to pick those deer out. But at 8 o'clock in the morning till dark, I look into the sun. Right. So in other words... As soon as it starts warming up and, and that initial hour or so of, of feeding, they're going to quickly go for shade. They may still continue to feed, but they're going to be, they're going to try and utilize any little shade pocket they can. And then they're even going, as, as the afternoon wears on, they, they lay there. The most predominant place to find them from say 10 o'clock in the morning on is on a shade on a shady hill you'll find you know 90 percent more deer on the shady side than you will on the sun is that what is that That's what you a, think you're hit, hitting it right on the head and i don't know why anybody would not want to look it at, at, at the sun in the evening because that's that's what you've got to do because yeah. that's where those deer are going to be. So the sun's going down in the west, and I just told you earlier they're on the northwest side, so you've got to look at that. You've got to look into the sun. Or The problem what I found is most people don't want to look at the sun because it's aggravating. 
But there's ways to do that. Put a hat on, get in the shade of a tree. There's a lot of ways to do it. But you've got to look into the sun. Right. And I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And even down in Mexico, we do a lot of our hunts in January and, you know, during the rut and what have you. But even then, when it's warm, if it warms up at all, they, they're just so habitual to be in the shade in the afternoon uh, that I think, you know, when I hear people say sun at your back in the morning, sun at your back in the evening, I think they just like to catch those deer that are glowing. But I think if they would shift in the evening and put the sun in, or in the afternoon and put the sun in their face, and like you said, it's not easy to do, it's not fun to do at, at times, but it becomes real fun when you start picking up all kinds of deer in shady pockets. You hit it right on the head. And I, in my glassing lessons that I give to, to people all the time, that's exactly what I stress to them constantly, what, what, I, what you just said. So with these October hunts coming up, um, how important is it, do you think, to be out and be glassing all day? And a second question to that is, on these specific October hunts, Let's take the morning, let's call the kind of midday, and let's call the afternoon. In your opinion, can you rate those three glassing time frames and tell me if you had to not do one, which one would you do? And if you, you know, which two are the most important in your mind? The morning is always the most important to me. And the reason being is that the deer has settled down from being chased or shot at the night before. And if you found a buck, and let's just say I found a buck from a mile or so away, and I see him where he's going to be, I close the gap in the morning, and I'm sitting there where I think he's going to be, and I got a better chance to kill him right then before somebody else bumps him out of the world. Okay, so morning is number one for you. And then if you had to pick, say, between, let's say, 10 and 2 or 10 and 3, and then three and dark what have you found on these october hunts is most important i found that the three to dark it's generally right at dark if you're going to have a chance for for the caliber of bucks that we're chasing they're not they, they generally do not come out except right in the last five or ten minutes just before you cannot shoot the caliber buck that we're wanting to chase and, and that's what I have found, and that's what kind of makes that a little bit difficult. If you're in the wrong position and he comes out and it's too far or whatever it is, there is, then you've got a problem. And that goes back into the same thing we were talking about earlier about the scope, I mean, the, the, sco the, the sun in the binoculars. It is a tremendous barrier for a rifleman to look in there and to blind him like that. So a lot of times I've already got him set up in the shade, so if that deer comes out, there's no messing around. We're going to get a crack at him. Let's take a couple scenarios here, and let's say that uh, the night before the opener here coming up in a few days, let's say that you glass a target buck that you say, yeah, we would shoot him tomorrow. And, and let's say that right at last light you see that deer, and let's say you're, you're, you're not in range, you're quite a, quite a ways away from him and you have to move to be in position in the morning, what is your strategy if you, sit, if you see that deer the evening before, where are you going to be the next morning at daylight? Well, in my case, I've probably hunted these places thousands of times or, or, or scouted them hundreds of times, so I would know the point to be on. Instead of just willy-nilly guessing, I would know i got to be on that knob before the sun comes up. So I try to walk where I'm not bouncing uh, sound across the canyon to them so that we can come over the top and then just sit down and know that that deer is going to be there somewhere. Yeah, I think that's that's a great tip. Um, Dara and I kind of have a theory on a, a, there's like a barrier that we don't want to get inside of. And I would, without, you know, putting words in your mouth, do you have a certain distance that if, if you know, if you 
don't have to get inside that distance from a deer you want to kill. Is, is, do you have a certain barrier that you would prefer not to break? Yeah. I try to stay as far away from them as I can. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, and that's just the it. truth, Jay. And, and, and I'll tell you why. Because what I found of, of what I, I want to tell you a story real quick. I took Craig Bonington hunting with me 37 years ago. And we glassed this five coos deer bucks. And I'm making a, 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 a stock, and I get up on top of this knob, and these deer, they're up just about 400 yards, and we're getting ready to shoot. And these two hikers come walking along this trail. Every one of those deer laid down, laid down. And the hikers went right on by, and when they went out of sight and they quit talking, they, the deer all stood up, and Craig killed one of them. And he wrote an article about it. He would have never believed it if he didn't see it. But I have seen that hundreds of times. Voices and that pressure of that just that closeness or whatever it is, they either are going to lay down or they're going to explode and leave. But they're not going to stand up and just let uh, somebody walk up on them. I have known the owners of the Outdoorsmans in Phoenix for over 20 years. They are the authority on optics and hunting gear. Outdoorsmans is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, mounting accessories, and pack systems for all hunters. Their customer service is the best in the business. Go to Outdoorsmans.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any products. They're unbelievable deer. I mean, I always say they hold like, you know, tight like quail and you make a good point. They're either going to blow, you know, at four or five, 600 yards and blow and be gone or they will literally let you walk, you know, 30 or 40 yards. Would you agree with that? Oh, that's exactly right. And that's, and so I try to stay away from them and, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to get the caliber deer we want to chase. I don't want even to know I'm there until we, till we shoot. Yeah. And, and Dara and I always, have a thing we try not to get closer than th- if we if it's either us shooting or, or clients that are you know very proficient with their rifle we like to say if we can stay outside of 300 yards we never like to get closer than 300 yards to a deer we want to kill because we feel like that's for for coos deer hunters in our mind that's a chip shot and that's that you know that's that's a shot that every coos deer hunter should be proficient at and what we've found is anytime you get closer than 300 yards and you break that barrier, all sorts of bad stuff happens. And it seems like they always can pick you out. They hear a tripod clank or they hear your zipper on your rangefinder pouch or your backpack or they hear you pop your scope covers. Um, I think people that don't hunt them a lot don't realize how aware of their surroundings they are. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Well, every word you're saying is a truth, but let me put it in a little bit, probably more English. Let's just take a deer that's that's 90 inches. He's been hunted 25 times, Jay. Now, a lot of people ask me, what do you mean, Mr. Adams? I said, okay. Is that deer's a spike? He's been hunting with an archery and four seasons for that one deer. When he gets between 90 and 100 inches, he's been hunted five years in a row. That's 25 times that that deer has made it through all those seasons. Either he's dead or he's made it on learned how to survive. And he's learned how to survive because just exactly what you said a minute ago, clanking tripods, people talking, zipping, whatever the reason is, but he's learned that's danger and he's gone. And you may not see that caliber deer again. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, I want to ask you about home range of bucks, uh, specifically like habitual home range of bucks compared to does. Do you think bucks hold tighter and have a tighter home range, or do you think does uh, have a tighter home range than bucks, and kind of why or why not? I think that the, that the big bucks that, that I'm chasing don't only have a home range, they they have a specific place that they stay, and they don't leave it except during the rut, and they really don't like to even leave it then, to be very honest with you, the caliber bucks that, that we're talking about chasing. And I'm talking, when you start chasing a buck in the 115, 125, 
he has learned how to survive, and he didn't do it by being stupid. Right. Right. Do you do you feel like in you know genetically and such some of these genetically superior bucks? Do you think they could be you know four years old and be over one ten, or do you feel like they have to be up at that six seven year mark to be one ten or better? No, uh, I think that that's exactly right. I think four years and above, they they can be Boone and Crockett because I've killed those caliber deers in my lifetime by watching them as you know as they went right on up. I actually believe that it has to do tremendously amount with the, the amount of precipitation that they get up there. If those deer have to struggle to go get a drink, if they have to struggle to not get any kind of good, any kind of good uh, protein out of the food then I can see a tremendous difference in the horns. And if they get a tremendous amount of rain, I, I can see it on the kaibab and elk, and, and I know you know it on elk, and yeah. that, that water is, is critical to those the horn growth. Yeah, do you think coos deer, because they're you know severe browsers, do you think they're as susceptible to drought as, say, an elk, or less susceptible? Well, I think it depends on the mountain range. Because if you have a mountain range that has a lot of springs, that's one thing. But if you have a mountain range that doesn't have it, then 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 it can change. Because they'll go a long ways for a drink of water. And the problem with the drinking of water, it's not during the season. It's during the summer. June, July, and August, when those horns are growing, that's when they have a trouble. I, I have found... Uh, their horns is because they don't they just don't get it they don't get enough water so they have they're traveling and they don't get enough food it's not during the deer season uh most people don't realize that what i found is when i start seeing those deer that at that distance is that i'm watching them and they're having to walk a mile down to a tank and then back out well that's just common sense that takes a lot of a lot of stress on their horns so with that being said um do you really focus on canyons and areas that have, you know, if you're just trying to look, well, let me back up for the listeners out there that are learning how to coos deer hunt. And, and let's just say that they want to find bucks. Let, let's not even, let's just say they want to go and find bucks. Do you look in these mountain ranges and try and find drainages that have a lot of water or is that a, not a variable that you're uh, not too keen on? No, I, 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 I always, water's probably the first thing you look for, then you start looking for the, all the other types of foods. Water's very important. What I found, if there's, the Galeros is a prime example. Of, there's not a lot of water in the, in the Galeros, and it, where there is a lot of water, there's a lot of deer. So if you're looking at a map or you're looking at a, a units in, in southern Arizona uh, to go hunt coos deer, and you've never been there, starting at trying to find areas that have live water, big, big main drainages that have water, and then stock tanks, you know, searching Google Earth and, and such, that would be a, a big thing that you would look for? I think that's very important. And I think that's a learned thing. And I, what I mean by that is that a fawn goes there with his mother and gets a drink, and then when it comes back as a spike, it knows where that water tank is or where that spring is, and then as it starts to progress and gets older, it knows where those water seeps and things are. In the places that don't have a lot of water, there's not as many coos deer. And it's, it's just, I've just seen that more and more. There may be a big buck there that's made it through, but there's not a lot of deer. So the... With with what you're saying, um, you could also say that people have caught on to that water and coos deer are are one and the same. Meaning, you see more deer where there's more water, but you're also going to have more hunters. If you're t specifically targeting big bucks, you might find a little more arid place where the water isn't as prevalent. Maybe the deer numbers are going to be lower also. But there's a buck that's been able to just, you know, make it and, and you know, kind of be out of those out-of-the-way places. Is that what you're saying? And that's kind of the some of the holes that I'm hunting. Okay. Okay. Um, that's all great stuff. If you had to pick one caliber that you would recommend to people coming to hunt with you, what what would be your favorite or some of your favorites? 
Well, I'm like everybody else. I'm I like the long range rifles that these the, the gun makers are making today, and you know the seven millimeter mag is 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 as good as it is made, and there's a, the 300 Winchester mag is the same thing, and you know so all all those calibers are good, and the and the 6.5 284. So there's I have all of those guns, and I think any one of them is is a great coos deer gun. Nice. Um, you would not recommend anybody go coos deer hunting without a tripod, correct? No, no. <laughs> I I would recommend him even leaving a car. <laughs> and for those people out there listening that are new into it, uh, let's say they only have ten power binoculars, but they are on a tripod. Um, what what advice would you give them? Well, at least they're trying, and I see it all the time. At least they're trying. So you're not going to be able to glass as far as you can, but it's at least what you can see with with the 10 power, you're, if you see a deer move, you're going to be able to look at it and, hold, and lock it in. And what I found, Jay, is, and I see it all the time, when a guy pulls his binoculars down, handhelds, and is going to tell his friend where the deer is, they can't find the deer again every time. And so then the rodeo starts. It was over by the tree, by the rock, underneath the limb, and 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 it's, it, it's just a rodeo. But if it, you got it in your tripod, even if it's a Walmart tripod, and you lock it in, you can say, it's, "Okay, it's right there." You look look in the binoculars, and that's that's a world of difference for somebody that's that's, that's not as a uh, world class coos deer hunter. You bring up a great point. Of I, I think I'll add to that in that when you find a buck. And, and you know you're going to want to point it out to your buddy. I think you have to also be keen of the surroundings. Is there a big boulder? Is there a big oak tree? Is there a, you know a, a dead tree with a you know broken limb on the left side? Or you know be looking in your binos before you come out of the binos. Even though you have it locked in, how many times, Dwayne, have you looked in there? You see a big buck. And you don't really mark it inside your binos, and you go back to look in your binos, and you it takes you a while to find it. So don't you think, you know, marking the spot uh, with several landmarks when you're looking through your binos is huge as well. Jay, I'm, I'm going to go one better than that, and and I do this with every client. I start explaining to them what the cactuses are and what they look like when we walk by them. Do you, do you know what a barrel cactus is? No. This is one right here. You see this? That's a barrel cactus. You see this okatia? This is, I explained that to them. This is a century plant. You see that long, tall century plant? And they'll say, yeah, get these things in your mind. Because when we see a deer, these things are how I'm going to talk you to the deer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how many times have you seen the century plant that's leaning to the left and you're saying, do you see the sentry plant arm that's leaning to the left at a 45? And they go, what's the sentry plant? So if you don't have that discussion ahead of time, but if you do, then they say, yeah, you mean the one with the yellow wispies at the top? And you're like, yeah, you see how it's aiming? It's aiming right at the deer's head. Oh, I got him. Yep, um, that's right. Stuff like that is hugely important. I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, um, landmarks, but specifically, you know, Ocotillo, agave, you know, this is an oak, this is a mesquite, you know, the, it's, uh, you know, yucca or, uh, you know, it, it's that that's a great point. And I, you know, we use that people that hunt cooster all the time use that stuff. But that that's a great tip for people out there that are just getting into it. What would you say uh, to people that are going to camp out of their truck and, you know, day hunt, or they're going to backpack? What what um what issues do you see with backpacking uh as far as or mistakes you see people making when they're backpacking well the most of the mistakes that most people make when they're backpacking is they don't take enough water and that's that's probably the cr- most critical thing cuz i can't i can't tell you how many guys i've seen out there and they're 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 about ready to to vapor lock and yeah and literally when when you backpack in, the best thing to do is if you're going to go into places to go in the day before or, I mean, the weekend before and bring some water and, and stuff in there and drop that off in there 
and then the next time you go in, because it usually takes two trips if you're if 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 you don't know what the heck you're doing. Yeah, I think that's one thing you know we see all across the West, guys doing backpack hunts and and such. One of the things that's unique with Arizona is there's not a lot of water, and a lot of times you're up on a big ridge and you have to descend you know, a thousand feet or something just to go down in the canyon bottoms to get water. And it's sometimes not feasible. Plus you're walking through the terrain that you're hunting. Um, and you know, there's not a lot of water and there's not a lot of springs. So I think that's a good point. If you're, if you're planning to backpack, make sure that you have a place where you can easily get down and get water or make sure you pack enough water in. I think Dwayne, I think that's a great point. Um, what about the guys that are going to, you know, car camp or, you know, pull up to an area and have a base camp? And then what tips would you give them uh, about uh, going hunting out of a base camp as far as maybe, you know, what time should they leave? Where, you know, what time should they be in position? What mistakes you've seen people make? Last year, I, I, I had a client and I told the gentleman that right behind this camp, on the hill, there's always a good buck, but we're going to wait till these guys leave before we go over there because if they see us, they'll think that there's deer there. And they would leave, and, and I almost want to scream, like 15 or 20 minutes after the sun was up. And then they'd drive off in, in their Polaris. We would go and drive within... 200 yards of their camp and there were nine bucks behind their camp wow we ended up shooting at these bucks on three different occasions and we missed but that's hunting and that's guiding and that's just the way it is and i've come to that conclusion and finally on the fourth day we killed one of these deer and these guys kept come, came back to camp when we were coming off the mountain. And the gentleman says, you killed that right here? And I said, I just happened to say, yeah, we just drove by here. And he was standing there, and we killed him. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I didn't tell him what we were doing or what was going on. But most people leave the camp, Jay, so so late it, that, it, that it's terrible. I I tell people you've got to be in position wherever that is if you want a glass and you think it's a mile walk in there or a hundred yards it does not matter you got to be in position before the sun comes up yeah i agree with that not only i think a couple reasons one i think it lets the area settle down if you made any noise and two i think you know obviously from other hunter standpoint if you can get to the spot first at least when someone walks up on you up on a point, you're there first and you kind of have the argument that I'm here first, go find another knob. I hate the feeling when I get up to my knob and I'm late and there's someone already set up glassing. At that point, I have to say, well, he's here first. I'm going to go find another knob. So in, in all the hunting that I do, I always try and go extra early so that if that ever happens where you're, you know, you're in position and someone else comes, at least you can talk to the person and say, you know, I'm, I'm here first, you know, type of thing. If you're at a knob second, most of the time, uh, you need to go find another knob. Well, I agree with you a hundred percent. I think that that's just good ethics. And, uh, uh, and a lot of times I'll just, I walk over and talk to them. I said, how big a buck are you looking for? And when you say that, that really opens up a good a good conversation because a lot of times they're not even looking for the same deer I'm looking for. Right. A lot of times they're just looking for just to kill a deer, and then some. So a lot of times I'll glass for them. I say, "There's a buck over there. You see, you see that?" And they say, "Thank you, sir." And they'll take off and leave me. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's good. If if they're like you know, we would shoot anything. You could both sit there on the knob and glass. I think you bring up a great point. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, most people aren't after the, the, the and, and they don't even know that that kind of buck's in there in the first place, Jay. I'll tell you something else I started doing, Jay, and I'll tell you this, and this is, I started wearing an orange shirt all the time and an orange hat. Now, that sounds silly, 
But let me tell you why. Because I was after a great big buck, and I'd sat there for a couple days. And this young man from Tucson, he come. He didn't see me because I was all camoed up and doing the whole nine yards like a uh, like, like I'm. Uh, the deer wasn't going to see me, and I'm wearing my camouflage. This young man come walking up to me. And he said, "Sir," he said, "If I'd have seen you, I would have never walked up here." And when the light went on in my mind. I said, "You know what, Dwayne? I'm going to start wearing orange, and those hunters won't come up here." And that's been a really big thing is now I wear an orange hat and orange shirt and I beat them up in there and when they see you when they see you Jay they're not going to walk up there because they don't want to walk up there because you're already there yeah for sure that's that's an awesome point uh I, I hadn't thought of it from that angle that's that's a great point yeah you can have five guys sitting up there all camouflaged and what is that going to help if you're all looking at the same place that's the, that's silly but where I wear orange and a lot of times I'll take the orange hat and I'll put it up on a stick a little bit higher above the where I'm sitting. Yeah. Yeah, and so you feel like people glass from way low and they're like, oh, somebody's already up there and they don't even come up there. That's what I'm telling you. It works like that. It really does. Real game calls featuring the elk reel. Real Game Calls makes innovative, realistic, and easy-to-master calls using their proprietary, revolutionary design. They are located and manufactured in Gypsum, Colorado. Their calls were designed and battle-tested on some of the hardest-hunted terrain on Earth. Check out ElkReel.com. Use the promo code JSCOTT and receive a 20% discount on all purchases. Go to www.ElkReel.com. One more question in regard, we could talk all day about coos deer, but one more question in regards to these coos deer. Um, with the temperatures going to be hot, it doesn't look like there's any fronts or storms or anything. Um, you're saying, back to what we were talking about earlier, first light is very, very important. Um, how important is it when it's hot, and is there a time frame in which you feel like they're going to bed down and then like I'm trying to get at like a midday kind of mid morning shade change. How important is it that you glass in those shade areas, but you actually, if you're looking in the right spots in the midday, you'll actually see them get up, change their bed. And then as soon as they bed back down, would you agree they're dead? That's a boy. You, you answered the question, Jay. That's a, that's exactly what we do. You, 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 what you just asked and answered is exactly what we do. So we're always looking at those north little, west little pockets, hoping that we can see a deer get up and get down and, and get up and walk around. If the sun's come on, got on him, and he'll get on the shade of the tree. And that's exactly how we're killing a lot of deer. And, and one more question with that. When a deer is up and feeding, do you make a move on him when he's up, or do you wait till he's down, and why? Well, that's a hypothetical quick question that you, I can't answer, and and I'll tell you why. Every situation's different. If he's up and we got a chance to move up to a hundred yards and shoot him, I'm moving and I'm shooting. Okay. But. But what if you you don't do that? What if he beds back down? And I move down to hundred yards and I can't see him. Yeah. So so every situation is different. So you know you have to you just have to be thinking all the time, and every scenario is different. And and sometimes I make mistakes. I mean, it's just the real world. But a lot of times I don't make mistakes, and I kill them. Yeah, I think. Um... It, that's one thing that if you have of of you know if you have three people hunting or you have a let's just say you have two, one thing that is huge is either if you're using a radio or not using a radio, if you can use some sort of signals, if you glass across and let's say it's not a scenario where you see something and he's up and feeding and you can't move and go kill right now, but you can stay in position and you can watch the deer and your buddy can go and get in position, whether he's taking his rifle or whether you have the rifle and he's just going to get closer, get in position, and then you're going to come to him. 
you either have a radio to communicate or you have some sort of signals worked out that means, yes, the deer is still there. Okay, I'm over here trying to relocate him. And then let's say he he gives you the signal that, okay, I'm in position and yes, I have him. Now you can come to me. How important is that leapfrogging uh, or being able to communicate either by radio or hand signal in being effective of killing these deer, Dwayne? Everything you said right there is exactly what we do too. We, 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 if, if that's the situation, we do that, and it works. But a lot of times you can't do that because a lot of times when that guy moves and drops off that mountain and gets down to that next position, he cannot see the deer. So if that's right. the case, I stay there, and right. I stay there, and I say, okay. And it, this happened to us last year, and my son-in-law had the client, and he t- went down there. And he never seen the deer after it was up for 30 minutes walking around there because of the way the angle was, he couldn't get it. And if he moved out farther, the shot was so far he wouldn't kill it. And when it got dark, he walked out and we left the deer. We went back the next morning and set up, found the deer, and then we cut him off before he got to his bed and killed him. Yeah, that that's good stuff. You know, I... I... I think it's so important to keep somebody watching the deer, even if the guy, let's say it's a big trophy deer and it's a record book deer and you don't want to use a radio because the guy wants to enter it in the book. So you're going to use some sort of signal. I always advocate leave somebody up high that's on the deer. Even if the whole day goes by and the shooter never gets a shot, at least you can come back and say, what happened? He's right there. I got him bedded for the morning, you know, right. and, and, and let's, let's reevaluate and regroup. Um, I think that's something that, you know, I can't stress enough as far as somebody has got to stay on the deer. And when I mean stay on it, I mean do not take your eye off it even when it's bedded. Watch it the entire time. Don't even get up to take a leak. You know, I've, I've done many times where I'm the one watching the deer and I'm like trying to take a leak, you know, leaning to the side while I'm still stuck in my tripod. You know, when I say don't take your eye off it, I literally mean don't take your eye off the deer. Because you've seen it. How many times, Dwayne, where they get up and boom, they're gone. And you sit there all day and they never appear. And they've been gone for six hours. Well, it's interesting you say that because my boy Luke Adams got the biggest ass chewing over that <laughs> at 16 years old. He's never forgot it. He's 38 today. I yeah. took the client over there. My son was glassing it, and he got up to go to the bathroom and got back down, and he lost that buck. And he didn't have enough to tell me he had lost it. He kept right. looking. I said, Luke, is the deer there? He said, yeah, it's there, Dad. It wasn't there. Yeah. So about three hours into the deal, I asked Luke, I said, Luke, is the deer there? He said, Dad, it got up and moved. I said, moved where, son? He said, I can't find it. And I said, what do you mean you can't find it? Well, I thought I told you to never get off of it. He said, I had to go to the restroom. Well, when we didn't kill the deer, but when I got back and got him to the truck, I told him, you pee your pants, but don't yeah, you exactly. get your eyes out of that glass, son. That's We lost it. We forced it, went back in there the next day and found it. It took me two more days to kill that deer. Yeah, and I think that's a lesson everybody could learn. Instead of having to learn it themselves, they could hear it. And it's so important. If if you are the designated spotter, I mean, what I typically do, if someone says, okay, you stay on the deer, right then I say, I'm. you watch them for a second. Let me take a break. Let me get my pack next to me, my food next to me, my water. Let me take a leak. Let me, you know, and then, okay, I'm on them. Go ahead and go. And then that way you've got everything you need right there. And I can't stress enough, like, have your pack literally right next to you where you you can do the zippers, but your eyes are still in the binos. If, if you want to make me upset, you be the spotter, and I look back at you, and you're farting around in your backpack unzip and stuff and not have your eyes in those binos i'll do the same thing like you i'll go ballistic it's like once you're the designated spotter you you know you plan till dark that your eyes will never come out of the binos well it's that simple and you know I, i i don't i think you know i have a guide school and i only take one person a year and i take these young guys and 
and and, and when they're sitting there like that, I, I I I stress to them, if we don't kill this deer, it's going to be your fault. And I guarantee yeah. you it gets their attention. They say, what do you mean, Mr. Adams? <laughs> I said, I'm going to take this hunter over there. You watch this deer. If he gets up, you better know where he's going. Well, when you tell them with that kind of stress in, their, in your voice, they're paying attention to you. Because I also tell them, I said, you know my boy Luke? I said, yeah, ask him how this went when he got out of the binoculars. Well, you you got to tell them, this is serious. We're not playing around out here. Yeah, for sure. For sure, and you're trying to be as efficient with your time as you can, um, and I think it's hugely important. Um, that's all great stuff. Um, that's just great stuff. It's it's great to hear, you know, after 40 years of hunting these things, you still have the passion for them like you did. I mean, it sounds like you do. Do you? I do. Oh, I love it. I, I, I... In my last elk camp, I told the, told the clients that I, uh, they were asking me how long I'm going to guide. I said, I'm going to guide till I die. I said, I, I, I don't nothing else interests me but hunting. I don't care about nothing but hunting. So one day, they'll say, there'll be the coroner at the camp, and they'll be taking me out. That's the way it's going to be. <laughs> That's great stuff.